All right, John chapter 17. Are we there? Say amen. Anybody else got a testimony? I knew that was like pulling teeth getting that one out, but anybody got something they want to say? Other than hurry up and let's get out of here. No, y'all don't want that, do you? Amen. How are we doing outside? Does it look all right? All right. Huh? 37 minutes. I can do it. I can do it. John, John chapter 17. Amen. Verse 11. This is the prayer that Jesus prayed to His Father. Um, he prayed this prayer in great distress. This is the place where He was in the Garden of Gethsemane and He was about to go to the cross and He knew it. By the way, Ron and Sandy, y'all look cute. You got the exact same shirt on. Now see, that, I'm going to preach, I'm going to use that. Okay, I'm going to use that. I'm preaching on unity. And I'm going to use that. You guys, bless, you're going to bless everybody today wearing the same shirt. Okay? All right. Anyway, this is the prayer that Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And He's in great distress. And He says to the Father, If there be any other way, let this cup pass from before Me. But then he says, nevertheless, let not my will, but thine be done. Now, keep that in your mind. Okay? Keep that in your mind. You'll hear me pray, and it's not just the ritual of my prayers. You'll hear me pray for your kingdom's sake, God. For your name's sake. For the sake of your word and your gospel. For your glory's sake. God taught me that many years ago. That when I quit worrying about what's going to happen to me and worrying then or be concerned with or have my mind set upon what happens with God's church, with God's kingdom. When you set, and here's what Jesus taught us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness all these things shall be added unto you. Now, all these things are the things that you and I worry about. The things that we care about. The cares of this world. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So we cast our cares upon the Lord, for He careth for us. And the Lord has reminded me at times, Mike, the reason why you're so far down is because you will not let me carry your burden. You're carrying something that you are not meant to carry. You're carrying a load that is too heavy for you, and you can't do anything about it anyway. So if you will let me take that burden from you, I will carry it. And then you take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And when I start thinking that way, God is right. When I start setting my mind upon the kingdom of God, God's righteousness, God's name, God's kingdom, God's glory, God's honor, God's word being glorified, when I set that as my priority and the things that I care about, then that is an easy yoke to bear because I already have knowledge from the word of God that God's kingdom is going to increase and God's kingdom is going to conquer everything on this earth and He's going to win in the end. Amen? So when I, when I set my mind there, then I've already, I've already won. The battle's already over with. Okay? It's like someone buying one of these lottery tickets. You know, there's two lotteries out there that you did not win yesterday. One was that, there was two, one was like 400 some odd million and the Powerball was 500 some odd million. And it's like, you've got all your hopes set that you'll win the lottery so it can pay all these bills that are overdue. 
and you're worried about that, and you don't win the lottery. Now what are you going to do? Now you still got the same problem that you had, but you spent money on the lottery that you should have spent paying your bills, and it's, now the problem is worse. How many and who in here has ever had God pay a bill for them? Raise your hand. And some, every now and then, you got money to spare. But most of the time, you're even Stephen like us. We're just even Stephen, okay? When you are concerned with God's kingdom, God's righteousness being fulfilled in your life, then He means what He says. Then all of these other things, I'll take care of. I'll grant them, I'll give them to you, or I'll give you something way better than that. But if you let me take care of it, I'll take care of it. And this is the kind of prayer that Jesus is praying. This is what's on his mind when he's praying this. So John 17, 11, he said, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And look at verse 20. Jesus again says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Don't you underline that? Believe on me through their word. That's the ministry of the apostles and the prophets. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Who in here would like for the world to believe what it is that you know? And we're praying for lost people this year, right? We got to, we're going to set our mind on lost people. And we're worried about how we can convince them that what we're saying is right. When there's so much out there that people have been spoofed, people have been lied to, people have been deceived. And so people just, they, they just got their guard up every time you come to them with the gospel or anything like that. They just, they don't want to hear it. Right here is what he says, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's where my heart is. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me. So get this now. If Christ is in you, and God the Father is in Christ, who do you have in you? God, the whole thing. Okay, in, in Christ is the Godhead bodily, and so when you have Christ, you have it all in you. Set, set your mind on that instead of what the Pentecostal or Charismatic would tell you, that you get saved and you have Christ, but you don't have the Holy Ghost. No, 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 no. If you've got one, you've got the whole deal. It's all one, Amen. So, verse 21, I am them, thou and me, that they may be perfect in one. This is what we strive for. Perfect unity. It's worth having. Because it's better than the alternative. The alternative is strife with every one. So you can have one of two ways. You can live in strife with everybody or you can be in unity with everybody. And the choice is yours. But Christ has prepared the way and made the way so that you don't have to live in strife with everybody around you. Fighting everybody all the time. Arguing with everybody all the time. Being being mad at everybody all the time. So you don't have to be that way, or others don't have to be that way with you. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Underline, love, love. You will never be at one or unified with anybody that you don't love. Amen? We can apply that and then we're going to pray. Husbands and wives. You have a choice. You can either be 
one together, unified, or you can be at each other's throats all the time, be fighting all the time. Parents and children, children and parents. Children, this is as much you as it is mom and dad. You can be, at, you can be in agreement with mom and dad, or you can be fighting mom and dad all the time. And here's what I know. I know that, and I know some personally, some I'm just going to guess on. But practically every adult that you see in this room fought their mom and dad at one point in their life. Am I right? And they regret it. They regret ever doing that. I was in Bible college, Linda Carmichael, my first year at Bible college, and my mom called me every Sunday morning before she went to church, before I went to church. We had a pay phone in the dorm right, right outside my room. Seven o'clock in the morning, that phone would ring, and I knew it was her. So I'd talk to her. And one Sunday morning, J.R., my mom decided to unload on me. I mean, she come after me with both barrels. And I'm thinking, I'm 18 years old and I'm 500 miles away. So I listened to it long enough and then I went, click. I hung the phone up and I walked off to go get ready for church. Five minutes later, the phone rang again. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I thought, I ain't answering it. She can't make me. She can't make me. And the Holy Ghost was going, get over there to that phone. And after a while, I went back and answered it. And she said, don't you ever hang up on me again. Okay? I wish I'd never done that. I regret it to this day. Because my mom sacrificed everything that she could so her son could go to Bible college, learn how to preach the gospel. And all I did was take advantage of it. It wasn't right. Okay? Um, children and parents, husbands and wives, pastor and church, church and pastor, people, a congregation together, uh, neighbors in a neighborhood, okay? People that you work with, even, even lost people that you work with, okay? There can be a unity there. A, a unity that the union will never bring, okay? There can be a union. There can be a oneness there. There can be a nation that is not divided against itself. Okay? It can be if it's done God's way. So you think about that and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings, Lord, upon this. We ask, dear God, that you just stay this weather. And Lord, just, uh, just lead me so that these people get home safe. But Father, so that they are blessed this morning. That's the responsibility you've given me. And I pray, dear God, that you would lead me in that. Let us be a blessing here. Let us be a blessing to those of our church people that could not be here this morning, that will be watching at home either now or later. Lord, let us be a blessing to those that are watching online. Lord, they need us here today. And I pray, dear God, that you would help us with that and, and just bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, last week I, I just covered this about the husband and wife. There should be one flesh and so on. And I talked about this, but let's take our Bible now and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. There are certain things that cause us to be unified. Certain things. Now this is going to be primarily as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ is primarily who this is going to be to. And um, let me just say this, that the approach that I'm kind of bringing this morning is there are a lot of people out there and churches that still hold to preaching this Bible, this King James Bible. They're, they're still out there, okay? Um, and one of the things that really troubles me is that there is a lack of unity 
amongst all of those who agree that this is the Word of God and to whom shall we go? No, but there is no other Bible that has the words of eternal life. We'd all agree to that. Um, I've, there, are, there are men that have contacted me in this last week. One was a, a, a Baptist pastor. The other one was a, he called himself a non-denominational pastor. I don't know really what he was. But they both emailed me this week and they said, Pastor, we, we love you. We've been watching you. We appreciate the things you say. You've encouraged us as we pastor. We believe and hold to the King James Bible. Now, we don't agree with everything you say, and you probably don't agree with us, but we believe that the King James is the Word of God, and we appreciate what you're doing. I did not write them a hateful letter saying, boy, if you just come on board with me then, why don't you keep listening, then you would be like me. Hey, maybe God did not make them like me. That would be a mistake for God to make them like me. Amen. God purposely makes people a little different in their lives, even to where they believe different things about the same Bible and believe certain other doctrines, some, some of it's prophecy, some of it's doctrine. But if they believe that this is the infallible, inerrant Word of God, I do not consider myself their enemy. I do not wish to be their enemy. I do not want to be at odds with the people that by the Word of God, I am their brother. Because I have accepted by faith that this is God's Word and there is no other. I'm saved by this book. And I don't feel like being the enemy or being the target or being at odds with them. Or, and some people have tried to get me. Oh, have you seen uh, so-and-so online? Well, they said this. And what they want me to do is they want me to go attack that person. I'm not doing that. As far as I know, that man says he believes the Bible. Who am I to be this man's judge and to call him out? That mindset needs to go. And that's the mindset that pervades in social media, especially in social media. Because it gives people a voice like, I believe the truth, I believe all the truth, I'm right about everything, and since everybody else is wrong, I'm going to call them out on how wrong they are. I've done it, and it ain't right. Which is why you don't see me on Facebook much. I know everything I do ends up on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and everything else, but you don't. Every time I get on there, I just get, a, I get into it. And I don't like going, I don't like going to the same place and getting in the same fight all the time. I don't want to be that way. So, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, number one, has Christ Jesus come and captured you. You are His, amen. You are His prisoner. Now look at what He said. He's not a prisoner for the Lord. It's not what he said. He said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. You know what happened to Paul on the Damascus road? Christ met him, put him in handcuffs, and he said, you're mine. You're going to be my servant. Now, Paul's willing in this. He's complicit in it. But the Lord is the Lord of his life, and wherever the Lord tells Paul to go, that's where Paul goes. And whatever the Lord tells Paul to do, that's what Paul does. And that's how it is. That's how it's supposed to be with us. With the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. If God called you, you think about why He called you. Now listen to me, and this is a true statement. God never calls those whom are qualified. He qualifies those whom He calls. And when God saved you at that time, you were not worthy of the salvation that God gave you. Raise your hand if that's you. Hey, look, raise your hand if that's you. You're not worthy of it. Do you see those hands, everybody? So that makes us all one. Amen. We're all in agreement that we're all sad, low down sinners. Should have gone to hell. Amen. So he makes us worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. We are called to a ministry. We are called to a job. 
We are called to be soldiers. We are called to be the church of the living God. And Jesus said, they'll believe in me that I've risen from the dead because of your love for one another. And because I'm in you and God is in me and you're one together. You know what I hear from a lot of people? Well, I went to church at a young age and they just all was about fighting one another and everybody fighting over this and fighting over that. And he said, I just decided I didn't want that. So I just quit going to church. I think I'm a good Christian. I just don't go to church anywhere. And there's a lot of people on the other side of that camera that have told me or sent me emails saying that they got tired of the fights that were going on and they pulled out. And they didn't have a place to go to church until God sent them here. And we're glad to have you. We just don't want to start a fight. Amen? Okay. And number two, verse 2. You walk worthy of the vocation. Verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness. Low is the key word here. And God laid it on my heart last night late to preach on humility. And I knew it wasn't for today because I didn't have the notes ready. I don't have anything ready to preach on humility. But I think probably at some point I'm going to preach on humility and humbleness. And how I struggle with that. And have struggled with it. I sat down across from a preacher one time. I was interviewing for a job at his church. And he said, can I be very honest with you? And I said, yes, but yeah, please, please be. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I like it when people tell me good things about myself. I did, Chris, I did. I was young then. And he said, the first time I met you, I thought you were a very arrogant, cocky young man. I thought you were very full of pride and full of yourself. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure that you're somebody I can work with. And I went, Boy, do you have me wrong. It hurt my feelings that he said that. But God told that man to say that to me because he was right. You wouldn't believe the number of fights that I started because of my arrogance, because of my pride, because of my mouth, because I had an attitude that I was better than other people. And that hurt me bad in the minds of other people. They hated my guts. A young man that I ended up being best friends with in college, he heard that he was in one of the singing groups and they had asked me to fill in for a guy for a weekend. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And he came to me. He was the tenor singer. And he said, can I talk to you for a minute? Sure. He said, can I tell you something? He said, yeah. He said, I don't like you. Why? He said, because I had this feeling that you're very arrogant, you're very full of pride, and you're very cocky the way you handle yourself. I went, really? And he said, yeah. And he said, when I found out you were going to be singing with me this weekend, he said, he said, it ticked me off. And he said, I threatened not to go simply because you were going. And God sent that man to tell me that. Because I needed to hear it. Because people wouldn't have anything to do with me. Because I was too high for them. You know how impossible it is for people who are down here to be unified with people who are way up here? Do you know how hard that is? It's next to impossible. But if God has us all down here, you know, what I, you know what I see on my end when we have an altar situation? and people, When I see people down here at the altar, you know what I see them doing? Holding hands. Putting their arms around one another. Crying together. You know why? God's humbled them. And they're both one and unified together in their humility in that they're both crying out to the Lord and God has drawn them ever closer together than they ever have been. And I've seen that save situations in this church. I've seen it. Lowliness and meekness, long-suffering. Hey, you know what? There's four things here, Ryan. 
Lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, and forbearing one another in love. What is that number four? The gospel. Jesus was low. He was meek. He was long-suffering. And he forbore with his disciples and us when he went to the cross. All four of them are there. Forbearing one another in love. Long-suffering. See, I like that word suffer. That means you're putting up with people's garbage and nonsense and their character traits that you don't like. And their little personality quirks that you wonder how in the world people like that ever survive in society. You don't like this about them and you don't like that about them. Thank God you're not them. Okay? Listen, I've seen it all in church. Okay? But you long suffer with them. And you do it in hope that one day God will bring you two closer together. Now, I could be talking about a marriage. Long-suffering marriage. Lisa and I are not two peas in a pod. There's differences in the way she was raised, differences in the way that I was raised. And they all came out the first several years of our marriage. Little things about how we used to live versus how she used to live. And God put us together. And usually there's an argument or a fight about this thing in the house or that thing in the house and how this is supposed to be here and this is supposed to be like this. And how, oh no, on Thursday night we watch this show and not that show. And by the grace of God, 30 and a half years later, we're still not quite two peas in a pod as far as being similar to one another. But the very key things we agree on, we agree that there's nobody else out there for either one of us, that God brought us together, that God has used us over the years, and that God is going to continue to do those things in both of our lives together. And nothing else matters. I would say this, had it not been for her, I probably would not be. My mind was to go out wherever, and God used her. Okay? Okay. So now watch this. I'm going to get. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, this is the year of endeavor. The unity of the Spirit in the bond of what? Peace. Who in here likes it when it's peaceful? Who in here just thrives on stress? You may not try it on it, but you're good at it, I can say that. I love you. Hey, I am. You do that like my mother used to. Let me just say this. Verse 4, let's, let's run through this. There's one body. There is one body. And only one body. There are churches that are not like us. Body of Christ. When I went to Kenya, we saw churches and church people out there. Alicia will tell you they don't sing like we sing here. They don't stand still when they sing like we stand still and sing here. Okay, they move about and they get happy with it. And we, we watched them and we didn't see anything that was done of a fleshly nature. They were not being lascivious at all. It's just in their nature. They got a boogie. And they did. Okay. But we saw a joy in their singing and in their heart that sometimes I wish we had. Okay. Now I'm not knocking anything that we do here. It's just that God cut us out a certain way. I know some other churches in America that are a lot more vocal about their singing, about their praying, about their testimony. God just hasn't made that like that here. Yeah, maybe he won't. I don't know. This is part of the body, though. And he's... Come on, John. Am I losing my mic? Oh, yeah, I need a, need a battery. Hurry. Rain's coming. We're going to blame it all on JR. Okay? 
but there is one body. Turn to, uh, let me just run with this, and I'll, I'll go to uh, Ephesians 4, verse 11. Thank you, sir. That's not where I wanted to go. That's not where I want to go. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. That's where I want to go. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me of that. One body. There we go. We good? 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now Paul is setting something up here. He's setting up the idea that there's a lot more people that are saved other than us here. A lot more. There are other churches that just because they don't say it the way we say it, just because they don't know the things that we know or do the things that we do, they are still God's people and they're part of the body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is not going to deny them just because we here don't like it. Amen? That this will get us off our high horse as fundamentalists. As fundamentalists. If we're not careful... We'll get very cocky about the things we believe. We believe the King James Bible. And we act like we're the only saved people in the whole world because we have this one Bible here. Now maybe God's got to bring some other people around to that differently than what He did us here. But God is always in charge of that. We are not. I can't save all of the churches. I'm responsible for this one. And we are part of that body. We are part of the Spirit of God. And he says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diff diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Then he's going to list them here. By there's nine here. Nine is the number for fruit bearing. Think of a birthing. Think of a child being born. Nine months. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man prophet with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit dividing to every man severally as He will. It's a mistake for one man to say, I think all the churches ought to be in evangelism. It's a mistake for one man to say that. It's a mistake for one man to say, I think all the churches ought to have the worship that we do. It's a mistake. It's a mistake for one man to say, I think all the churches need to be preaching prophecy the way Bethel Church does. That's a mistake. God did not make those churches that way. God did not lead them that way. I had a young man that came and visited us one time. And he was, he, he was agreeing with me on some issues on prophecy. But he said, I, he said the, the churches that I come from, they don't see it this way. And he said, but they're all King James churches. He said, how do I reconcile that? And I said, hold up your left hand. He held his left hand. I said, now hold up your right hand. I said, they kind of look the same, don't they? He said, yeah. I said, but they're not, are they? He said, no. One's just about as opposite as the other. And there's some people out there that they don't like some of the things I say about prophecy. There's some things that they say that I don't like about what they say about prophecy. And we're about as opposite as can be, but... And yet, there is a similarity there. And yet, God uses this hand for one thing, and God uses this hand for another. Do you see that? Now, think of just this church. Who else in this church can do what it is that I do every week? Can you do that? Todd, can you do that? 
Joe? Joe says, don't look at me. I'm not to expect that everybody in the church ought to be doing what I'm doing. I ought not to expect that everybody online ought to be doing what I'm doing. Have your own blog, have your own show, have your own this, have your own that. Some have replicated that. Some have tried and it didn't work. God didn't make everybody like me. You ought to thank God. You ought to get down on your knees and thank God He did not make you like me. But likewise, I knew some preachers that they were always in a fit, Lynn, when they couldn't get everybody in the church to get up and go soul winning and go door knocking and handing out tracts. They were always tied up over that. And they were always at odds with their church because they couldn't get... I talk to this guy every time. How's it going, brother? Oh, I can't get people in my church to do nothing. And he's on his like 17th church in his whole career. Because he couldn't get them to do anything. And I don't know if that guy ever came around to the conclusion that God did not make everybody in a church exactly the same way. Who in here can pray? Raise your hand. Everybody can pray. Who in here can read the Bible? Everybody can read the Bible. Who in here can memorize Scripture? See, now we're cutting down on some of you. I didn't say you do memorize Scripture. I said, can you memorize Scripture? Some people don't have that ability. They can't memorize very much. Some people can. You know why? God made them different. Who in here can go up to someone just out of the blue and say to them, have you ever thought about Jesus Christ and eternal life? They can just go up to somebody just out of the blue. Okay? Believe it or not, I have a huge problem with that. But you know what? And Lisa will tell you, I can go to these guys wearing these military caps, Ron. Every Friday I see them at Costco and Sam. And I, walk, I never fail to go up to one and shake their hand and say, thank you for honoring and serving your country. And I've had some of the tr most tremendous responses out of them. And then there was a guy the other day wearing Jesus as my Lord cap. And I walked up to him and I said, Sir, I go around to these guys wearing military caps, thanking them for honoring their country. I want to thank you for honoring our Lord Jesus Christ. He just got happy about that. Okay? But I don't see my wife going up to these guys and th thank you for honoring your country, sir. She doesn't do that. But there are things that my wife does that she's really good at, and I'm not. God designed her a certain way to do a certain thing. Ron and Sandy, look at you guys. And yet, poor Ron doesn't have his head covered. And he's not supposed to in here. Amen? She does. And it's fine with her. But they're all dressed alike and... Now, do you guys ever disagree on anything? Sometimes, okay? But you're still together. Still love the Lord. Both believe the same Bible. Saved by the same Spirit. But God has made you both different. Amen? So one, the wisdom that I've learned in all the years, and I didn't see this this way when I first got into the ministry, but I see it now. The wisdom of what makes a good church and what makes us united together is not expecting that everybody should be exactly identical. Because he says here, if you look in verse 14, for the body is not one member but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? For you to say, well, I can't sing or I can't talk in front of people the way these people can. I just don't do much in the church and I feel bad for it. Can you pray? Yes. Can you read your Bible? Yes. You qualify. And God will use you in a certain way. He may use you just to be someone greeting people at the door. And what did David say? I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to be running around with the lost people. Thank God that you're here. Amen.
So he said, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased who? Him. So I don't expect, and I'm just, I'm going to boil this down. I'm going to let you go. I've got one rule here. I do. I've, I've, all these years, I've only had one rule here. And it's, and it's based on this. I don't think everybody ought to be doing what I'm doing. I don't think everybody ought to be doing what Alicia does or what Lisa does or what Rose does or what Melissa does or anything. I don't think everybody ought to be doing every, and, and getting in everybody's business at all, all the time. I don't think everybody has to live the same lifestyle as everybody else. Some people don't like to watch television. Some people like to watch television. If you don't watch television, watch television. Just don't watch garbage. Don't listen to rock and roll. Don't listen to rap. Don't listen to hip hop. Don't listen to a lot of that country music. Don't listen to that garbage. Don't listen to Willie Nelson, Conway Twitty. Don't listen to these people. They're, and that's about as far as I go, as far as remembering country music. Okay? Don't, don't listen to Elvis. Don't listen to these people. That's rotten. That's no good. That's... But if you want, if you listen to radio, listen to radio. If you don't listen to radio, don't listen to radio. If you want to do something for Christmas, do something for Christmas. If you don't want to do anything for Christmas, don't do anything for Christmas. If you want to hand out candy on Halloween, hand out candy on, and hand out tracks like Wayne and Jan does. Or if you don't want to do that, don't do that. But if God leads, if God leads Wayne and Jan to hand out a hundred gospel tracks with their candy, what is that to everybody else? You can say, I don't believe that's right. But God didn't tell you yes or no to do that. God told them to do that. Okay? And that's their, that's their calling and that's their business. Because, I mean, let's just be honest. The finger just doesn't belong in every part of the body. Okay? Not everybody is for everybody. Not everybody has to be part of the clique. And not everybody has to sit on the front row or the front three rows. Or that this. Not everybody has to do that. And I've learned that over the years. Not everybody has to have the same dress code. Not everybody has to have the same this and same that. But here's what I've learned. Okay? If we're here, and we can have our distinctiveness, and yet we can get along with each other, We've got something. Because that's what this says. That's what this is. That's what he said. Okay? Um, the Spirit, God brings them to bed, brings them as part of the body as it hath pleased Him. And the rule I have is, let's get along. We all got to get along. Because if we don't get along, then we ask the question, what are we doing here? And that goes for you folks online and in the Bethel Facebook group. If you're not getting along with everybody, what are you doing there? Because I've had people come in just with the intention of starting trouble and trying to straighten everybody out on something. And I don't put up with that. Gone. Because if you're not there to get along, I mean, why are you here today? We're here because we need to be here. We need to hear the gospel and we need to be loved. Because they don't love us. We're supposed to love one another though. This is our people. And if we're to love anybody, we're supposed to love our own and do it unconditionally. There was a man that called me this week. I'm going to let you go. There was a man that called me this week He's having issues with his wife. His wife is in a real bad way. And I get it. I understand it. And there was something that God has just impressed upon my heart to say to him. And I hope he's listening today. What I didn't tell you on the phone the other day is, I'm going to ask you, do you love your wife? And will you love her unconditionally? Which means, will you still love her even if she doesn't love you back or doesn't show you that love back? Because if you can love her and set no conditions upon it whatsoever, well, I'll love her as long as she loves me back, that's not real love. If you can set love upon her 
unconditionally. And, and, and nothing she does is ever going to take that away from you. Then you really have the love that a husband is supposed to have for his wife to begin with. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he loves us unconditionally. He's never taken our sins and used it against us in our relationship. He died to forgive us of our sins. Okay? And when we can love somebody or everybody in our church unconditionally, we've got it made here. Can I hear God's people say amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I love you. And I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me and all the things, Lord, that you've had to show me because I'm not the person I preach about. Lord, in my flesh is the very wicked nature that I preach about and preach against. And God, I'm guilty like I'm preaching to everybody else they are. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of picking fights. I'm guilty, Lord, of saying things out of pride. I'm guilty, Lord, of not being humble, not being meek, not being long-suffering. I'm guilty of that. And God, I ask you to forgive me, and I ask God's people to forgive me. Lord, I, I want to love people, and I want to love your people the way you love them. And so, Lord, I understand how hard it is sometimes to love somebody when they're just not like us. And yet, Lord, teach us how to love them, teach us how to care for them, teach us how to care for their needs. Teach us how to understand them. It's like a husband dwelling with a wife. He dwells with her according to knowledge. Teach us to get to know people, Lord, and to know why they see things the way they see it, and to walk in their shoes a little bit, to understand their side of it. So God, teach us how to do that as a church. Teach me how to do it as a pastor. Lord, you're sending people here to this church from many different places and many different backgrounds. And Lord, I'm supposed to love every one of them that comes here. And I'm guilty of not doing that. Father, forgive me. Lord, teach us long-suffering. Teach us patience. Teach us, dear God, that we can still be part of the same body and still be one, even if we're not all the same part of the body. But everybody has a place that you put them in. And you're using them for that. So God, teach us this. Teach us the value of it. Teach us, Father, how important it is to love one another. And how important it is for the gospel's sake, for us to love each other. Because if we don't love each other, how can the, how can the world see that we love them? So Father, instill that in us. Father, we thank you for letting us come here today. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe so far. I pray, dear God, that you would minister to everybody today through the word, that you'd keep us safe going home. We love you. And we thank you, Lord, for this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. And remember, there is no afternoon service this afternoon. We're going to go home. And just wait for the rain and sleet and all that stuff to freeze over. And then tomorrow will be a better day. Amen. God bless you. I love you.